Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, June 17, 2022. Former President Donald Trump lashes out at the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, calling the investigation rigged and denying he ever called former Vice President Mike Pence a wimp. On this 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters, leading to the resignation of President Richard Nixon, a conversation with the Washington Post reporters who broke the story, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. President Joe Biden holds a virtual meeting with leaders of major economies on energy and climate, pledging new initiatives to reduce greenhouse gases. And British Prime Minister Boris Johnson makes a surprise trip to Ukraine's capital city, Kyiv as the war with Russia shows no signs of ending. We begin with former President Donald Trump, his first public appearance since the hearings of the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol began. Three committee hearings so far, making the case that Donald Trump, pushing a fake narrative that massive election fraud denied him victory in the 2020 presidential election, spurred on the deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol during the counting of the electoral votes. Former President Trump has called the Select Committee and Social Posts the Unselect Committee and today accused the members of being selective in the evidence it shows. The committee is taking the testimony of witnesses who defended me for eight hours, chopping it up and truncating sound bites to make it sound like what they said was absolutely terrible. But it's remember, it's also the people that weren't allowed to even testify that wanted to. A lot of people wanted to go and testify about what they saw and how crooked it was. Meanwhile, the committee refuses to play any of the tape of people saying the good things, the things that we want to hear. It's a one-way street. It's a rigged deal. Former President Trump at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Road to Majority Policy Conference at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center in Nashville, Tennessee. The House Select Committee's hearing yesterday, Thursday, focused on former President Trump's allegedly pressure campaign against his vice president, Mike Pence, not to certify Joe Biden's presidential election victory on January 6th of 2021. Donald Trump today disputing some of the evidence presented. One guy got up and said that he heard me calling Mike Pence a wimp. Now, now, in honesty, I'm the president of the United States. You know, I'm sitting, I I think they sat at my desk. He's a wimp. How many people listen to me? It's like, I don't even know who these people are. But I never called Mike Pence a wimp. I never called him a wimp. Mike Pence had a chance to be great. He had a chance to be, frankly, historic. But just like Bill Barr and the rest of these weak people, Mike, and I say it sadly because I like him, But Mike did not have the courage to act. Bill Barr was afraid of certain things, and you know what they were. Please don't impeach me. Don't impeach me, Bill Barr. Please. I said, what's wrong with being impeached? I got impeached twice, and my poll numbers went up. I don't want to be impeached, sir. I don't want to be impeached. The election was perfect, sir. It was perfect. It was so good. The election was perfect. And the Democrats are sitting back saying, no way we're going to impeach this guy. (laughs) Nah, it's terrible. But Mike was afraid of whatever he was afraid of. But as you heard a year and a half ago, Mike Pence had absolutely no choice but to be a human conveyor belt. He was a human conveyor belt. Even if the votes were fraudulent. They said he had to send the votes, couldn't do anything. I said, well, what happens when you have more votes? And you had voters. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Detroit. See what happened there? Philadelphia. U.S. attorney in Philadelphia came out and said Bill Barr would not let him get involved in election fraud, and he wanted to. Mick Swain, a good man who I think was destroyed by this, he was not allowed to look at election fraud because the Republicans were afraid. They were afraid of the consequences. Former President Trump in Nashville, Tennessee, at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference. On the subject of faith, a new Gallup poll today finds Americans' belief in God at 81 percent. 
and that's down six points in five years and the lowest since Gallup started asking this question 78 years ago. And back to the House Select Committee investigation, the committee today posting a recap of Thursday's hearing. Here's the first minute with former Vice President Mike Pence and the leaders of the committee, Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson and Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. That President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. And frankly, there is no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. Donald Trump wanted Mike Pence to do something no other vice president has ever done. The former president wanted Pence to reject the votes and either declare Trump the winner or send the votes back to the states to be counted again. Mike Pence said no. What the president wanted the vice president to do was not just wrong. It was illegal and unconstitutional. As the federal court has explained, quote, based on the evidence, the court finds that it is more likely than not that President Trump and Dr. Eastman dishonestly conspired to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. Liz Cheney and Benny Thompson plus Mike Pence A compilation posted today by the House Select Committee on the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Former White House aide to President Trump, Peter Navarro, today pleaded not guilty to two contempt of Congress charges for refusing to comply with a subpoena from the Select Committee. Navarro spoke with reporters outside the courthouse. To this point, up to yesterday, I've been handling this case, what they call pro se, been doing in a civil suit context, and I thought... Uh, that we could handle this matter in a civilized way, dealing with constitutional issues. Obviously, uh, being put in leg irons and having people want to put me in prison have changed matters. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, my legal team here. Defendant Peter Navarro, one of his lawyers, John Rowley, also making a statement. The case involves a number of complicated issues. constitutional issues, issues concerning whether um, a former high-level executive from the Trump administration can be compelled to testify about conversations that Mr. Navarro had with, with President Trump, um, and those issues will be, will be decided by the court in this case. Um, I don't want to speak any further about the case right now, uh, but I would like to say a few words about the circumstances of Mr. Navarro's arrest. John and I are both former federal prosecutors. We've never seen anything as outrageous as what happened to Mr. Navarro. He is charged with two process crimes, misdemeanors. The FBI knew where where he lived. They had spoken with him the day before he was arrested. They waited, nevertheless, for him to go to National Airport. When he was boarding the plane, they stopped him on the, the jetway and they arrested him. They put him in handcuffs. They put him in leg irons. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that does not typically happen to career criminals. So we have real questions about what happened here. Uh, There there were news reports that came out almost immediately after the arrest. This was coordinated. And one of the things we intend to find out in this case is who made that decision to treat Mr. Navarro that way and why was that decision made? Attorney John Rowley standing next to Peter Navarro, a judge today setting a tentative trial date for the contempt of Congress charge against Navarro for November 17th. Navarro asked to delay it into early 2023, but that request was denied. Today is the 50th anniversary of the break-in at one of the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, D.C. at the Watergate office building, a scandal that became known as Watergate and led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon. The two Washington Post reporters who famously tracked the story, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, sat down today with Washington Post political correspondent Dan Balls. He asked them about Watergate then and the January 6th attack now. We learned during the Trump administration that the main instrument for holding a president accountable, which is impeachment, no longer seems to work because it is now a purely political enterprise with party line votes. The constitutional system worked during Watergate. The press played its role. 
The investigators played their role. The Senate Watergate Committee played its role. The House Judiciary Committee played its role. The Republican elders went to Nixon and said, you don't have any support up here. He ultimately resigned. Uh, impeachment doesn't work. Both of you have said in recent days that this is not, that the Trump presidency is not just a criminal presidency, but a seditious presidency. So what is the solution to a seditious president? Is it through strictly the legal system? Carl, I want you to answer this first. Is it through the political system, i.e. the ballot box in which the public will render an ultimate judgment? Well, first of all, Bob's just pointed out about Title 18 and the section of the law in, in which Trump clearly, as, as Bob has said, uh, has committed a crime. But the next level up, as you suggest, is sedition. What, what is sedition? It is to encourage, foment a insurrection against the government of the United States. We have the first president in history who has attempted to engage and produce an insurrection. And so what do you do with that? One would hope that yes, there had been, you know, we failed an impeachment before. There ought to be, I think, uh, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General of the United States, now has a huge decision to make. Is Donald Trump going to be prosecuted uh, as the leader of this conspiracy? And indeed, the question of sedition comes into it. But I think we need to look at what has happened in the Trump presidency, just as we looked at in, in the Nixon presidency, this isn't just about the press. It's not just about the president. It's not just about the Senate and the House. It's about the people of the country. And one of the things that happened in Watergate was by the time of Nixon's impeachment, his approval rate, the number of people, the percentage of people who wanted to see Nixon either convicted in the Senate or resign from office had gone from 19% a few months earlier to 57% if we believe the polls, and they're somewhere in that. And, and we don't have that situation today. It's about not just the politicians, not just media, it's about the people of the country. We have a media situation in which, unlike at the time of Watergate, so many more people today are not open to the best obtainable version of the truth, which is what Woodward and I said for 50 years have, have really called the objective of, of reporting. Uh, people in this country today are looking for information in the media particularly to reinforce what they already believe and they're, to buttress their prejudices, their religious beliefs, their political beliefs. So we have a different country today. And the question in my mind is, is the country, people of this country, are they willing in sufficient numbers to say, look, we do not want an authoritarian presidency, et cetera, et cetera. We do not want to see this past president given kid gloves. Bob Woodward, Washington Post associate editor, Carl Bernstein, former Washington Post investigative reporter, Dan Balls, Washington Post chief political correspondent, Woodward and Bernstein, co-authors of the book, turned into a movie, All the President's Men. More from the discussion as Dan Balls asks about Watergate and whether there is anything left to learn. So the next question is unanswered questions. We have uh, a question that a viewer sent in, uh, Andy Barr from Washington, D.C., and he says, what is the one question about Watergate you still want the answer to? Bob? Yeah. Well, the, the unanswered question that pulses through all of this is why. Why would Nixon, who was president, who, uh, you know, he worked to attain, he lost to John Kennedy in 60, he lost the run for governor of California, and then he rehabilitated himself, re-engineered himself, and won in 1968, and he had, you know, the, the brass ring. He found it. And so what is the psychology, which I think we never cracked, really, of somebody who's attained their goal and 
fails to ask the question, which I think is the question presidents need to ask, is what do the people need? What's the next stage of good for a majority of people in the country? It's not hard to get an answer to that. But for Nixon, uh, it really didn't come up. It was always, I mean, I, can I read my thing from yeah, the, ahead. you know, he loves it when I get paper out to read. <laughs> but, this, but this is so relevant. Uh, this is from Nixon's tapes after, six weeks after he's won that re-election. And you know, he stuck it to the, everyone, to the Democrats, to the Washington Post, to the press. And so he's in the Oval Office with his aides. Remember, we're going to be around and outlive our enemies, Nixon said. And also, never forget, the press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. The press is the enemy. The establishment is the enemy. The professors are the enemy. The professors are the enemy. Write that on a blackboard a hundred times and never forget it. That's somebody who can't let go of his grievances, who can't, who has, I mean here, you know, the press, we were on uh, the Colbert show and I was tempted to read that and then ask uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, you know, you weren't there at the time in 73, but are the late night television hosts uh, upset that they didn't make the cut? <laughs> the, the people who are enemies. But, you know, this, well, it's... Well, the enemies list. Yeah. Nixon maintained, the White House had an enemies list of people, as are on the tapes, the word, to be screwed, to have their tax returns audited, et cetera, et cetera. Bob Woodward, Washington Post associate editor, Carl Bernstein, former Washington Post investigative reporter, Dan Balls, Washington Post chief political correspondent on the Washington Post Live program. Washington Today continues in a moment. June 14, 1971, Deputy National Security Advisor Alexander Haig delivers news of a leak of confidential military documents to President Richard Nixon. Nothing else of interest in the world? Yes, sir. Very significant, this... Uh got a New York Times expose of the most highly classified documents of the war. Oh, that. I see. That, that, I didn't read the story, but uh, you mean that, that was leaked out of the Pentagon? Sir, it, uh, the whole study that was done for McNamara and then carried on after McNamara left by Clifford and the Peaceniks over there. They would become known as the Pentagon Papers, and their publication would go on to change history. Beginning July 1st, Season 2 of Presidential Recordings, featuring the private phone calls of President Richard Nixon. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check out Season 1 with the private phone calls of Lyndon Johnson. And welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. A story at CNN, President Joe Biden on Friday convened a meeting of more than 20 of the world's largest economies to discuss steps to curb methane emissions to address the climate crisis, as well as efforts to stabilize global energy markets amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine. At the U.S.-hosted Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate, the president argued Russian President Vladimir Putin's war has sharpened the need to achieve long-term reliable energy security and stability, quote-unquote, and fueled a global energy crisis. We should build upon the success of the Global Methane Pledge, now more than 115 countries strong. To do that, we're announcing a Global Methane Pledge emerge, uh, uh, excuse me, energy pathway to ramp up the speed at which we reduce methane leaks from oil and gas sector, and also helping bridge our energy needs. Each year, our existing energy system leaks enough methane to meet the needs for the entire European power sector. We flare enough gas to offset nearly all of the EU's gas imports from Russia. And so by stopping the leaking and flaring of the, uh, this uh, super potent greenhouse gas, 
and capturing this resource for countries that need it, we're addressing two problems at once. Second, we're investing in innovation and, and, uh, and hastening the scale up of new technologies like carbon capture and advanced nuclear and clean hydrogen. The International Energy Agency says we need $90 billion worth of demonstration projects for this decade. And thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed here in the United States, we're stepping up with $21.5 billion contribution toward this goal. For example, we've launched a multi-billion dollar effort to create hydrogen hubs all around the country. And using the Defense Production Act in our system to boost the manufacture of electro lasers, which are used to produce clean hydrogen. We've done, we're doing both these things. Our Department of Energy also just issued a loan guarantee to construct one of the world's largest clean hydrogen storage facilities. And I challenge us together to hit the full $90 billion target by the Global Clean Energy Action Forum that the U.S. is hosting in September in Pittsburgh. Third, <clears throat> Russia's war is driving up prices of gas. Everybody knows that. Hurting people in all our countries. It's an immediate problem that I suspect all of you and I know I'm working every day. Over the long run, we can remove the pain of volatile gas prices and reduce transportation emissions by putting more zero emission cars on the road. In the United States, we're building a nationwide network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. We're strengthening our supply chains for the critical materials that go into those batteries. And we've set a goal of ensuring that half of all passenger cars sold in the United States in 2020 will be zero, 2030, I should say, will be zero emission. I urge all of you to join us in a similar goal. Fourth, if ocean-based shipping were a country, it would be the eighth largest emitter in the world. It's critical we do more to promote zero emission fuels and green shipping carters in this sector. And it seems to me we ought to be able to do that. That's why the United States and Norway are launching the Green Shipping Challenge to fully decarbonize shipping by 2050. And finally, Russia's war in Ukraine is worsening food insecurity, in part due to the skyrocketing price of fertilizer. Fertilizer production relies on natural gas, but more than 50 percent of nitrogen fertilizers are lost globally every year due to waste. So today, the United States is launching a new global fertilizer challenge. Let's aim to raise at least $100 million toward increasing fertilizer efficiency and developing alternatives by COP27. And to keep strengthening our adaptation efforts this year, the United States is going to partner with Egypt on the Adaptation in Africa event uh, to deliver concrete initiatives that are going to improve people's lives and build resilience into a changing climate. President Biden in EEOB, a virtual meeting of the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate, the largest climate meeting of world leaders ahead of the United Nations COP27 in November. President Biden's approval rating has fallen to 39 percent, according to a new USA Today Suffolk poll out today, with 71 percent of Americans polled saying that the U.S. is on the wrong track. Newsmax reports Representative-elect Myra Flores, Republican of Texas, told Newsmax that she won her election in the historically Democratic Rio Grande Valley this week because the Hispanic community is pro-God, pro-life, pro-family, and all about hard work, when Democrats increasingly aren't. Flores won the special election in Texas's 34th congressional district on Tuesday, avoiding a runoff with her Democratic primary opponent, Dan Sanchez, by winning, she became the first Republican to represent the largely Hispanic region in recent history. Here is part of the Newsmax interview with Myra Flores Thursday night. The Hispanic community were, were pro-God, pro-life, pro-family, all about hard work. And that's not the today's Democrat Party, unfortunately. And like my father said, you walked away from the Democrat Party, because I did back in 2010, but my father says that the Democrat Party walked away from him. He sees that the party has gone so far left. They're focused on nonsense like Latinx. You know, they're, they're focused on 
you know, all this Washington uh, nonsense, pronouns, and not on the real issues that are affecting real people here in South Texas and honestly throughout the country. You know, the issues are gasoline is more expensive, groceries are more expensive, health care is more, more expensive. And what the Biden administration doesn't understand that is behind the, his policies are real human lives. And I've worked with the elderly community for over eight years. And, you know, they tell me and they've told me over and over and over that they're hurting tremendously because they do live on a fixed income. So just imagine what it's like uh, to be one of them right now. They they thought they were going to retire and enjoy their retirement. And now they're thinking that they probably have to go back to work because it's just not enough anymore. Congresswoman-elect Myra Flores, Republican of Texas, interviewed by Newsmax on Thursday night. On Wall Street on this Friday, the Dow was down 38 points, the Nasdaq up 152, and the S&P also up 8 points. The Food and Drug Administration has given its approval for COVID-19 vaccines for young children, the Moderna vaccine for kids up to age 5, and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for kids 6 months to 4 years old. The last step is CDC approval, which could come as early as Saturday, and then the first shots into arms next week. House Majority Whip James Clyburn, chairman of the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis, sending a letter to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis calling on him to reverse or explain his decision after he declined to order COVID-19 vaccines for children under five years of age. Clyburn writing, your decision to reject these vaccines could deny Florida parents the ability to make their own decisions on what's best for the health of their children and could deny some Florida children the ability to live long and healthy lives. DeSantis said on Thursday, there's not going to be any state programs that are going to be trying to get COVID jabs to infants and toddlers and newborns. That's not something that we think is appropriate, and so that's not where we are going to be utilizing our resources. Senator Chris Murphy, lead Democratic negotiator in the agreed-upon bipartisan framework to address gun violence, issuing a statement Thursday night, We've continued to make progress over the last two days and have finalized agreement on the majority of our framework's provisions. Our staff is currently drafting legislative text on those areas of agreement as we work through the final sticking points. I believe we can bring this to a vote next week. The Senate and House are not in session for business today. First Lady Jill Biden spoke about this work in Congress as she spoke today to the National Parent Teacher Association's 125th Anniversary Convention in National Harbor, Maryland. She reflected on her career as a community college professor and the recent mass shooting at the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. As a teacher, I've imagined that scene in my own classroom again and again. You know, at the start of each semester, I'm sure all of you in here who are teachers do this, you explain to your students on the first day a path a pathway to get out if a shooter comes into the school so that they're prepared. You know, I explain it to my students because, you know, they need to know what they should do if the worst happens. And though I now go to work with the Secret Service, I've often wondered over the years, and it's true, you know, this is my 30, I think I'm going into my 38th year of teaching. You know, I wondered over the years if my students would be the next heartbreaking headline. All of you in here who are in the classroom know this. So Congress did not act after Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Parkland. Nothing changed. And nothing will change unless we change it. Joe has called on Congress to pass common sense gun safety reform. Things that the majority of Americans want. And a bipartisan group of senators have come up with a plan to address gun violence. And it would be the most significant gun safety legislation to pass Congress in decades and with bipartisan support. There are no excuses. 
It's up to Congress to act. First Lady Jill Biden at the PTA convention at National Harbor, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has made a surprise visit to Kiev, Ukraine today, a day after the leaders of Germany, France, and Italy were there, meeting with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in a show of support for Ukraine against Russia's military invasion, now closing in on four months long. Prime Minister Johnson's Twitter posting his produced video of his visit. Great to be back here again in, in Kiev and uh, to see to see you, but to also to see how life is coming back to the streets, to the cafes, to the restaurants. It's much livelier, I think, than it was just a few weeks ago when you and I went on our impromptu uh, walkabout, uh, Vladimir. But we've got to face the fact that only a couple of hours away, a barbaric assault continues on entirely innocent people, towns and villages are being reduced to rubble. And as you rightly say, Vladimir, we continue to see the deliberate targeting of civilians. So Vladimir, we're here once again to underline that we are with you to give you the strategic endurance that you will need. And we are going to continue to help intensify the sanctions on Putin's regime. We're gonna do everything we can to continue to strengthen the diplomatic coalition of support around the world uh, for Ukraine. We're gonna work together to liberate the, uh, the grain, as you rightly say, that is being held hostage right now uh, by, by Putin, depriving people around the world of the, the food that they need. And of course, we will continue as we have from the beginning to provide the military equipment that you need, and now, of course, the training that may be necessary to go with that, uh, with that new equipment. And we will work together with you and with our partners to rebuild your wonderful country for the benefit of Ukrainians and, I might say, for the benefit of the whole of the global economy. Video posted by the British government on Prime Minister Boris Johnson's unannounced visit to Ukraine. Johnson has announced that the U.K. will oversee a new three-week training program for Ukrainian soldiers that he says will fundamentally change the equation of the war. This from Reuters. President Vladimir Putin asserted Russia's strength and resilience on Friday against a Western world that he accused of colonial arrogance and trying to crush his country with an economic blitzkrieg of sanctions. Addressing the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, a showcase event being held this year with almost no Western participation, he returned time and again to the theme of Russia's sovereignty in a new global order. No, they don't want to respect the choice of Crimea that when the first sanctions against Russia were imposed. They had large-scale military operation in Donbass. For eight years, they were shelling people. No one was noticing that. Kiev authorities refused to implement the Minsk agreement, and it seemed normal to them. And that what brought us to the current situation. That's why it all happened. And then they started to build an anti-Russian bridgehead in Ukraine. Well, what if we will start building anti-American bridgehead somewhere at the American border in Mexico, for example? You can imagine what will happen. But no one even thinks about the possibility of such things happening near America. We even removed our military base from Cuba some time ago. And no one even thinks about it. No one even wants to think about it. And we have so many threats now. Hundreds of times we were suggesting to come to some agreement. Oh, no. Why do they have this arrogant stance towards everyone, including us? Well, because of some alleged superiority, air of superiority that they started again after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I understand this. And as for what we will do in the future, well, of course, we are going to protect the interests of the people for whom our lads are fighting, are getting wounded, are dying there now. There could be no other way. 
Otherwise, why do we have this kind of losses, this kind of casualties? Of course, they are going to protect those people, but eventually only it's up to them what will happen in those territories, and we will respect any choice they make, no matter what this choice is. Thank you. Russian President Vladimir Putin at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. That video with an English interpreter coming from roughly Russian state-owned video news service. And the Reuters article also mentioning that a denial-of-service cyber attack on the St. Petersburg Forum accreditation system forced President Putin to delay a scheduled address by an hour. And this from the Associated Press, the European Union's executive arm recommended putting Ukraine on a path to membership Friday, a symbolic boost for a country fending off a Russian onslaught that is killing civilians, flattening cities, and threatening its very survival. Thank you for listening to Washington Today. Top Washington stories can be sent to you every day if you subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. You can sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night and a great weekend. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every day we take your calls live on the air on the news of the day, and we discuss policy issues that impact you. Coming up Saturday morning, Council on Foreign Relations Senior Fellow Stephen Cook discusses President Biden's upcoming visit to Saudi Arabia. And then in our Spotlight on Podcast segment, New America's Lee Drutman and James Walner of R Street Institute talk about their podcast, Politics in Question, which examines America's political institutions and ways to improve them. Watch Washington Journal live at 7 Eastern Saturday morning on C-SPAN or on C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app. Join the discussion with your phone calls, Facebook comments, texts, and tweets.